Welcome to this video on The Houses of the Sebatu from the tabletop role-playing game Demon the Fallen. The Sebatu, or Seven Houses of the Fallen Angels, are a legacy of the Fallen from their former status as angels, held over from the order of their own creation and function before their war against heaven and imprisonment in the pit. In a sense, the Fallen are angels still, albeit stripped of a large portion of their former power. But without further ado, the Houses of the Fallen. The Defilers. The Nereids were the angels of the deep, the lords of the oceans, and the most beautiful of the Elohim. In addition to the millions of creatures of the seas and oceans, the Nereids were the angels of inspiration and creativity. They longed to create and to create for an audience that could appreciate their works. Yet, the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, were blind and deaf to their arts and the emotions they were intended to convey. The Nereids were creatures of the sea, and man was a creature of the land, a barrier between the angels of the deep and those they were created to serve. The Nereids longed for humanity's approval. Some demons believed that if Lucifer had not called for rebellion against heaven, an angel of the deep surely would have, such as, say, Belial. The rebellion made the defilers their symbol, as they spurred humans and angels alike to throw off heaven's shackles, raising morale at points when the rebellion seemed lost, before it finally and truly was. Yet even as they marched into hell, the defilers never wavered in the belief that theirs was a just cause, but they were the first to succumb to the torments of the abyss, twisting in their agony and hatred until it consumed them. But with freedom, the defilers have returned to plying mortals with visions of the unknown and the untasted, and leading those who can be tempted into ruin. The majority of defilers tend to be either Faustians or Raveners. Defiler Raveners are the quintessential scorned lovers. As they have been ruined, they seek to ruin others, luring mortals into falling in love with them. If they can use a betrayal to destroy an entire group, even better. Faustian defilers bear humanity an unusual kind of respect, at least for humanity as a whole even as they remember humans being something better and purer before the Fallen lost the war. Few defilers joined the ranks of the Luciferians and the Cryptics, and fewer still the Reconcilers. The path to the new paradise will not be found in the Morning Star's wake, or in God's dubious mercy, according to them. The defilers seek out the souls of self-obsessed and the sensual, those fixated on being fashionable as opposed to introspective. They also prefer those who have fallen deeply in love and been rejected, as this speaks to the Defiler's view of their relationship with heaven and humanity. For Defilers, gathering faith is precarious. While they can get mortals' attention easily, they cannot easily direct it how they wish. Fawning sycophants are only useful to a point, mainly as a base upon which a Defiler can build faith. Defilers tend to gift their thralls with intuition and perception, to improve upon their particular art or passion. But passion is a double-edged sword, and defilers have a tendency to drag their followers and allies into trivial or nonsensical quests that make sense only to the defiler themselves. If refused, a defiler can turn sulky and childish. Defilers prosper in situations of controlled chaos, where they have just enough space to indulge themselves, but not enough to sabotage their allies' plans. The Devils The Angels of the Dawn were the first of God's creations, His best and most perfect, the closest to His own nature, and the princes of the Elohim. The Devils were the messengers of Heaven's will, a fact that gave them pride to the point of hubris, and the proudest and most beautiful of all the heralds was their chief, Lucifer Morningstar. A full half of the Angels of the Dawn chose to join their master in rebellion, more than any other house. They had been princes in the heavenly host, but in the infernal host, they were warlords and champions. Time and the brutality of the war separated the devils from the humans they claimed to stand for. The devils eventually became tyrants and demagogues, seducing angels and mortals alike with lies and promises. They believed in themselves, in Lucifer, and in the righteousness of their cause, and they kept on believing until the bitter end, when they were cast into the abyss. But when Lucifer was not imprisoned with them, the other fallen came to the devils looking for answers, or vengeance. And the devils responded 
with their powers of manipulation by turning their fellow demons' ire away from themselves and against each other. When the walls of hell cracked open, the devils returned to creation, some seeking to restore the horrors and glories of the Age of Wrath. Other devils seek to undo the sins of the past by saving humanity from the evils that beset it, to restore Eden, or to forge a new Eden of their own making, thus proving that their Lord Lucifer had been right all along. The devils are politicians par excellence, which means that they are represented in every faction of the fallen. However, the most numerous of them, predictably, are found among the Luciferians. Even after the fall in the exile, they remain loyal to Lucifer's vision of creation, even if they are not always loyal to the Prince of Lies himself. Following close behind are the Faustian devils. Worship is an excellent substitute for love, according to them, and they have not forgotten the goal of forging humanity into a weapon that will finally cut down the gates of heaven, a weapon that the Faustian devils mean to wield themselves. Cryptic devils seek to unravel the mystery of Lucifer's disappearance, of why the rebellion failed, and why their souls seem to be inextricably tied to the pit. Few devils join the reconcilers, but those few seek heaven's forgiveness by rebuilding Eden on earth, one tree at a time. But more important than God's forgiveness is humanity's forgiveness for what the fallen have taken from them. Ravener devils is almost an oxymoron, but there are those devils who would rather destroy creation than admit that their rebellion was a mistake that they did more damage to humanity and creation than if they had simply obeyed. The devil seeks souls broken by the pursuit of power and influence, as well as the souls of fallen heroes as their hosts. Those who use others possess the skills and talents that the devils prefer, politicians, executives, preachers, commanders, and those who lead. On the other side are the fallen heroes, those who might be tainted, but at the core of their being still believe in right and wrong and care more about the souls of others than their own, such as a crooked cop who occasionally shoots drug dealers selling to kids or a lawyer who gets embezzlers off only to mount a token defense on behalf of a child molester that gets him sentenced to life. As peerless manipulators, devils are uniquely attuned to the wants and weaknesses of mortals, whether individually or collectively. While devils do have an easier time of gaining faith from mortals, they also have to work hard to acquire the energy they require. Devils are quite adept at building personality cults around themselves, and most set to work creating cults as soon as possible. Devils have become quite fond of the pyramid scheme, where every new recruit brings in at least two more, who are likely to fall under the devil's sway. If these followers consider the devil to also be a god, more is the better. If devils can be said to have a weakness, it is that they remember being heroes, the Almighty's princes of heaven, and seek to return to those glorious times when they were lords of the host, and then the fallen world, which leads them to cast aside some of their labyrinthine schemes in favor of some grand show of bold and foolhardy courage. The Devourers the angels of the wild once held dominion over all living things that walked on or flew above the earth. That is over six million species of creatures, from the smallest insect to the mightiest mammal. The angels of the wild were proud, honorable, and stern. Humanity, the apex of creation, only increased their pride and their frustrations in equal measure. Humans were destined to master the wilderness, yet they had no understanding of how it functioned, how everything connected together. But the angels of the wild were both commanded to protect the beast and forbidden from directly interfering with man, whose ignorance could undo all of their careful work. The angels of the wild were not eager to join Lucifer's rebellion, but some were convinced to become devourers, rabisu, as the path to fulfill their seemingly contradictory missions. The devourers were utterly merciless against their former brothers, so much so that they were the first targets of the Malachim when heaven unleashed that terror against the infernal host. Still, the devourers believed they would be victorious until the moment they were bound in chains of fire. They marched into the lightless pit without fear, but the ages took its toll on the devourers' nobility, leaving room for guilt and madness to take root and bloom. When they escaped hell, they saw a broken world and looked for creatures that no longer existed, then howled their agony to the sky. 
Many devourers gave themselves over to their torment, seeking to avenge the world that humans had so wantonly abused and misused. Others see their escape as their last chance to draw creation from the edge of oblivion and to save what's left of the creation they fought against heaven for. Devourers tend to either be Luciferians or Raveners. For the Luciferians, honor compels them to follow the Morning Star's cause to the very end, to resume the war against heaven and forge humanity into the sword that will cut out the heart of the Almighty. The Raveners are mad with revenge and grief. They believe that heaven and humanity have both betrayed them, and that if creation is to die, then at least humanity will die screaming, their prayers for mercy unanswered by an uncaring God. But there are some devourers who are reconcilers, those exhausted by war and strife and hatred, who just want to build something that brings peace, rather than suffering. Cryptic devourers are a rarity, but these fallen want to know where Lucifer has gone to, and why. Because of their rarity, these devourers tend to be underestimated, something they use to their advantage. The Faustian devourer is a true rarity because the devourers are straightforward. Subterfuge is almost alien to them, and the patience that deception requires often exceeds their tolerance for such. But they believe that the only way to save the world is to enslave mankind. The devourers find purchase in the souls of those who are driven to either protect or exploit, defenders and predators in equal measure, those who stand against overwhelming odds and still come out on top. Even low torment devourers are reapers of faith. As stated earlier, devourers are not known for their patience, so they prefer a variety of short-term reapings to a long-term collection of faith. Low torment devourers tend to restrict their reaping to criminals and destructive types. However, they refrain from killing their targets, as it gives the mortals in question an opportunity to change before the devourer comes for them again, with no third chances in their heart. High torment devourers take what they will, from whom they will, friend or foe, and killing their victims means less than nothing to them. If they are allowed preference, a devourer will reap from the strong-willed and aggressive, and may even make thralls of such intimidating people. The faith of the weak and the meek is poor sustenance to the fallen angels of the wild. It should go without saying that devourers do not do well in situations where discretion or diplomacy are crucial. Because of their directness, devourers are sometimes easy for more guileful fallen to manipulate into carrying out their schemes. But this is a risky gambit, as a devourer who realizes that he has been deceived will become an implacable and deadly enemy to his deceiver. The Fiends Most intricate and glorious of the Elohim's works is the great celestial engine that controls the fates of millions and billions of lives. The movements of the stars and planets are only the most apparent cogs of the machine, and the angels of fate are the sailors and captains guiding their vessels through the black ocean of the void. On a more practical level, the movement of the spheres affects the tides and changes of the seasons as mortals perceive it. And though they were fond of mortals, their place was not to walk on the earth, but to dance among the stars. So it is curious that fate would choose one of their own, Arimal, to be the spark that ignited the rebellion and subsequent fall. Arimal had read the skeins of fate and foresaw creation's doom if the Elohim did not act. To this day, the fiends are quietly shamed by Arimal and would likely destroy him if they could find him. But the fiends were welcome among the rebel angels as their foresight could mean the difference in battle against the heavenly host. But it was the fiends' own arrogance that led to the downfall of their kind. They did not foresee the destruction that the Age of Wrath would bring, nor did they believe that the Elohim could break what they had made. But they certainly did. For the fiends, hell was a particularly painful sentence, as the pit defied both shape and definition. It could not be mapped, shaped, or navigated meaningfully. And for creatures of consistency and routine like the fates, it was even more maddening than for their brethren. So when the hell prison cracked open, the fiends flew into the storm more eagerly than others. But what they found nearly broke their hearts. The great cosmic engine had been left unattended for too long, its once smooth and orderly wheels rusted and cracked to the point of shattering completely, not unlike the fiends themselves. For the fiends, the return is a renewal, a renewal of the search for understanding and meaning, 
both of which they had when they guided the planets and stars and stared into a million times a million futures. This hunt for clarity has led many fiends into the camps of the Raveners, though there is a question of just how much destruction they seek to inflict. Few of them are so far gone as to believe that breaking the great celestial engine will accomplish anything other than returning the fall into hell forever. So more restrained fiends join the cryptics to try and discover what happened and how to repair it. Not many fiends are reconcilers, as few had any business with Eden before the rebellion, so paradise is more of an abstract to them than it is to the other fallen. Not as a time when creation was whole, but when they were still unbroken. A large number of fiends are Luciferians, as the Morning Star protected them from the rebels and loyalists alike when the Age of Wrath was at its worst. Most of the most senior members of the Fiends say that Lucifer's fate remains unfulfilled, though they refuse to elaborate on what they have seen. Last, but certainly not least, are the Faustian Fiends. Rather than looking to the stars and planets, they seek to chart the fate of humanity through the study of history, technology, psychology, aesthetics, and a myriad of other fields as they once plotted the course of the heavenly bodies. The Fiends seek the souls of the patient and the bold, those who would seek truth even if it means walking into the dark without a light to guide them. Put another way, those with more bravery than good sense. It is the struggle for truth that the fiends seek out, the willingness to sacrifice oneself in safety for it, that draws the fiends like a moth to a flame. It is that lure that allows the fiends to acquire faith. They find those mortals who hunger for knowledge and enlightenment and give them the means to find what they seek rather than simply hand the knowledge over. Fiends of low torment are less masters of those they take faith from than confidants. High torment fiends, on the other hand, are masters of the lie by omission. They give their victims just enough truth to put themselves in danger, and then offer another pact to extract them from it, allowing the mortal to dig themselves deeper and deeper into both servitude and insanity. The Malefactors when the land was called forth from the sea, the angels given charge of this new domain were the Angels of the Fundament, also known as the Artificers. Their rebel element would become the Malefactors, and the Malefactors truly loved the earth and all that came from it, especially stone and fire and metal. The Malefactors sought to teach Adam and Eve, but they could not comprehend either the Malefactors' tools or their methods. Their subsequent progeny came to resent the malefactors and their perfectionism, while the rebel fundamentals were angered and hurt by humanity's seeming unwillingness to conform to the predictable sameness of the elements that the angels loved. The malefactors rebelled not for love of humanity, but out of resentment for both the creator and the created. Their love was reserved for the earth, and for their fellow rebel angels, who the malefactors believed were the only ones who were capable of understanding them. But the malefactors found little solace in their fellow Elohim as they were consumed by wrath for heaven until they withdrew from their own kind in favor of strategizing the war and constructing new and terrible war machines for the fight. Unleashed from hell, the malefactors weep at the irony of humanity embracing tools and artifice as the angels had once tried to teach them, only to use those instruments to turn paradise into a desolation. No few malefactors have wept at what has become of their work. Then they buried their pain and returned to their labors, whatever those might be. The Faustians claim the largest number of malefactors, as they regard humans largely as tools and servants who have quite stepped out of their proper place. Curiously, a slightly lesser number of malefactors are also reconcilers. Despite their alienation and isolation, they still love the world and refuse to give it up as lost, even if it means submitting to the primacy of heaven that they scorned so long ago. Some malefactors are cryptics. Despite their hand in building creation, much of what has happened in the interim between the war and the exile is a mystery to them, one they are eager to unravel. Few Luciferian malefactors exist, as the fall in hell diminished the force and righteousness of Lucifer and his cause in the eyes of most of the fundamentals. But those who still cling to the morning star are fanatical in their devotion. The number of malefactor raveners can probably be counted on one hand, two at most, but this small, unhappy band, with their skill at creation, makes for a group of brilliant and terrifying destroyers. Malefactors are drawn towards the souls of the lonely and the lacking, 
who felt incomplete and self-destructive in their pursuit of completion. Unfortunately, in the final nights, this cuts across a wide swath of humanity, from those disinterested in their fellow man to those who prey upon their fellow man. Additionally, malefactors have a hard time gathering faith apart from reaping. They do not relate to humans, so human desires and needs are not something that the malefactors are in tune with, so they cannot easily give mortals what they desire. However, malefactors often target mortals who are like their hosts, those whose lives are missing something and are in search of a concrete, physical solution to their woes. Malefactors find it much easier to reap mortals, usually with some item or tool of their own devising. Ultimately, that same humanity is the malefactor's greatest weakness. Unlike their creations, which are predictable, orderly, and mostly unfailing, humans by contrast are downright chaotic. As much as malefactors would be loath to admit it, humans scare them, and always have. The great fear of the malefactors, held deeply within their own hearts, is that if humanity ever mastered the divine spark of their creator, it would only be a matter of when, not if, humans finally destroyed creation for good. The Scourges The angels of the wind may have loved creation more than any of the other Elohim. It was their duty to carry the breath of life to all that lived and protect the things that they animated. They actually considered humanity to be as much their own children as gods. They also grew more frustrated than any other house by the man and woman's refusal to awaken to their full divinity. Every day was both a joy and a torment, a new opportunity and a bitter failure. When Lucifer raised his banner of revolt, many angels of the firmament followed willingly. Other than the angels of the dawn, the scourges claimed the highest ranking fallen among the infernal host. The scourges gave themselves over to the war with all of their being. Even when they were cursed, it only hardened their resolve against God's will. And after the fall into hell and the escape, the scourges are respected for their exploits during the war and their loyalty, if not to Lucifer, then to the cause of the rebel host. It is that loyalty that guides many scourges towards the reconcilers. The world has always been humanity's, and it is their duty as its creator to heal it for their beloved charges. Other scourges still believe in Lucifer, that he will return to lead them to victory now that they are freed from their prison. Few scourges are Faustians or Ravagers, Many scourges still love humanity too well to either use them as tools or destroy them out of spite. Many scourges cling to the idea that humanity and creation can still be saved. But this decayed and degraded paradise is full of fear. Fear which the scourges are compelled to blow away like a tempest wind. With their penchant for appearing to rescue humans, scourges are able to gather faith with great ease. Unlike the numerous quacks and fly-by-night faith healers, Scourges actually can cure incurable diseases and heal those that medical science have written off for dead. Likewise, the scourges offer swift vengeance to those whose souls cry out for justice or retribution. Ultimately, scourges are demons of extreme views. Either humanity is the world's most valuable commodity to be protected and preserved at all costs, or humans are barely a mote of dust on the winds of eternity to be grasped and then cast back when they no longer are able to serve. Likewise, scourges either tend to condemn or excuse humanity as a whole, rather than judging individuals by their own merits, or lack thereof. The Slayers The Slayers were the last of the Elohim created, and assigned a task that made them unpopular with their fellow angels. They were to reap and end what the other six houses created, to make room for new creations. Despite their ostracism, the Halaku were satisfied in their task until God created man. The slayers were as torn as the rest of their fellows. Man and woman feared the sight of death, and so they feared the slayers' work. The slayers wanted to comfort them and tell them that they above all other beings were protected from death, yet they were bound to obey God's command to remain hidden until Lucifer showed them the path of disobedience and rebellion. So the slayers rebelled, because they wanted mankind to understand them, rather than fear them. This desire made God's punishment against the slayers and humans particularly cruel. Not only would mankind eventually die, 
but the slayers would be their reapers, and both would be alienated from the other forever. During the War of Wrath, the slayers did their part, venting their frustrations and rage on the heavenly host, yet they stayed on the outskirts of the rebellion, avoiding the personality cult that had sprung up around Lucifer and his dukes of hell. Now that the slayers have escaped from hell and reemerged in the world, they realize just how broken it has become without them. Some slayers are so despondent at the state of creation, they believe that the only option left for the world is a swift, merciful end. But there are others who believe that they can restore some semblance of balance between life and death. If they manage to succeed, perhaps, finally, humanity will understand the necessity and even the beauty of death. Slayers are drawn to mortals whose souls have been worn down and have little to no regard for their own lives. These are often the despairing, the abused, and the suicidal. On the other side are those who give of themselves completely to others, who view a life of service as a cause well spent, or expect their rewards in the next world. When it comes to gathering faith, slayers are the most likely to conceal themselves as angels of other houses, or even to disregard the distinction between houses, presenting themselves simply as angels, taking tactics from other demons. A high torment slayer might simply amass a death cult around themselves and reap the eventual benefits. Slayers gain the greatest faith by leading mortals to overcome their fear of death. As the bringers of the end, the slayers were poorly regarded by the other Elohim, which led them to be withdrawn and observant when it comes to the physical world. The residual human memories of their new bodies are uncomfortable and strange to them. Indeed, human foibles and desires are a source of frustration to their otherwise penetrating minds. Slayers are also decisive to the point of stubbornness. Once they have made a decision, nothing short of divine intervention can move them from it. Slayers with high torment tend to see the world more clearly as they remove themselves from its concerns, preferring to leave their mark, usually by murder, upon it before it disappears completely. Few slayers stand with the Luciferians. Few did when Lucifer led the infernal host personally. They did not rebel to glorify Lucifer, but for their own sake. Faustian and reconciler slayers are more common, as they seek to restore humanity's lost immortality, either through their own cunning, the Faustian view, or by restoring humanity's favor to God, the reconciler view. There is also a large contingent of slayers among the cryptics. There is a great deal about creation that the Sebatu have lost and must reclaim, especially concerning death and the soul. Lastly, the Ravener slayers are a mixed bag. Some seek to judge mankind in God's absence. Others simply want to watch the world burn, one soul at a time. And those were the seven houses of the falling. I don't have much in the way of closing thoughts on this one, so I'll just wrap it up here. Thanks for listening. The next video is Demon the Descent. Until next time.